welcome. Um, we are going through uh, Philippians. Um, I just pictured Paul would kind of look like that. So we're going to pretend that's Paul. Right? That makes sense, right? So, hey, make sure your book is turned to Philippians. How many of you got it? What's the first word? Paul. Uh, it's definitely P and Paul. Okay. So uh, before we do that, let's talk about it for a second. Uh, we'll paint a picture. Philippians. Uh, raise your hand if you know who Philippians is written by. No, you, no. Who? Paul. It starts it out with the person who wrote it. Now, what's interesting, we're going to talk a little bit about Paul. Did you guys know that some people actually believe Philippians, the book of Philippians, is actually three different letters, possibly in one. You can look it up. There's things that possibly support that and things that don't. Some people believe it's one letter in and of itself. Some people believe there's three different parts um, put together, three different letters. Um, but it is written by Paul. Um, a little bit, uh, let's talk about Paul for a second. So, well, Philippians, it's the church of Philippi. Um, so just like we would say Americans from America, it's the Philippians are from Philippi. So everybody say Philippi. Okay, sweet. We're learning stuff. Cool. Um, so Philippi. And, and so Paul and Timothy and possibly even they think maybe Luke were part of char starting this church and this movement of God in Philippi. People go, who's Paul anyway? So we're going to talk about that real quick. So Paul, if you don't know any of the story of Paul, Paul's original name was Saul. So Saul was a bad man. Saul persecuted Christians, like threw them in jail, beat them, stoned them. He was overseeing judgment of Christians. In fact, he was a very smart man. He knew a lot about Christianity, but so he could attack it. One day... Saul's out doing his thing, and he has a dream. And in a dream, a vision, God says, why are you attacking me? From that vision, he goes blind. Anybody know how long he was blind for? Three days. So Saul was blind. So he's attacking Christians. He's doing all this, these bad things, and he goes blind for three days. Literally can't see a thing. Someone leads him by the hand to a guy named Ananias, who was a Christian. Now, this whole time, he is literally um, fasting. He says he's not taking food nor drink. He's not taking food nor drink, and he's actually crying out to God, going, praying, going, God, like, help me do better. Like, he's actually trying to talk with God at this point. So um, at this point, um, they, they, they hand led him all the way to Damascus, which is interesting because some of us know, have you, how many of you ever heard of Damascus metal? It was started in Damascus. So this is actually a place that's been around for a very long time. So they led by hand all the way to Damascus, no food, no water, and this guy named Ananias prayed for, Je prayed for him in the name of Jesus, and his vision was restored. At that point, he became one of the biggest movers of the gospel of Jesus. He changed his life. He turned it around. And what, what he ended up doing is he, he said, hey, he went around going, okay, I know Christianity, and now he's all for God, and so he's going around, and people, he was going town to town, and people were like, wasn't this the guy that was attacking Christians, and now he's saying he's all for Christians. And so it was a little confusing, but it actually rang true to his testimony. You want to know why? Because he went from attacking to supporting. And he became actually what we would say is kind of a modern traveling missionary. He went around starting churches, sharing the gospel. Now, go with me on this. If we ever go to a place and make an impact on a place... But then we leave. What good is that? Unless we somewhat can follow up. So Paul wrote many letters. He started all these moves of God in different places. Started all these churches. And he was constantly writing letters to people, to churches, to encourage them, to correct them, to let them grow in Christ and to do all these things. And this is where we get the book of Philippians. He had already gone, shared the gospel in Philippi. There was already a move of God happening, and he wanted to write to follow up. 
In fact, at this point, he is in jail. And we'll see that later as we dig into this. But Paul, within Philippi, he was actually known as, they, they said he was constantly disturbing the city by sharing the gospel and all these things. So he was constantly under attack and all these things. So he gets put in a jail. So he's continuing to write letters to all these moves of God and these people, these people groups that he's gotten to minister to. They actually think that he, they, he could be anywhere in Ephesus, Caesarea, or most likely they think he was in Rome while this was written in jail. So I want you to put that in your mind frame as we go into this. He was in jail. He wasn't in a great place. He was in a hard place. And that's where we start. Here we go. Philippians 1.1. 1, 1. First word. Sweet. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all God's holy people in Christ Jesus at, at Philippi, together with the overseers and the deacons, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it out until completion, until the next day of Christ Jesus. It is right for me to feel this way about you, all of you, since I have you in my heart. And whether I'm in chains or defending and confirming the gospel, all of you share in God's grace with me. God can testify how long for all of you with the affection of or uh, with the affection of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to listen and discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes from Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Whew. Let's pray real quick. Lord, as we talk through this, help us hear what you want us to hear. Speak to us. Make it clear, O oh Lord. We thank you. Amen. So the title of the sermon is called I See You. I see you. We are getting ready. You guys are, most of you already started school. In fact, I'm pretty sure almost every single person started school. If not, you're probably in homeschool, at which point I hope you still started school because there's things to learn. But whether you like it or not, you started this next season. You're interacting with new people. Maybe you're interacting with some of the old people. Maybe, I don't know, maybe you got a new job and you're like, okay, maybe you're driving now and there's more responsibility and all these things. And we are constantly seeing new people. In fact, tonight we have new people. And one of the things I want to talk about is the importance of being seen. Not the importance of me being seen, but seeing others. When we read this, this first part of Philippians, how many of you were like, man, that is so positive. Like you hear it and you're like, oh my goodness, like great joy be with you. I feel joy when I get to talk to you. I think about you and happiness comes. I feel it. Oh my goodness. Guys, he's in jail. And he's like, I pray for you and, and I'm so happy that I know you and that we're, we're fighting the fight together. And he's saying all these things and yet he's sitting in a cold jail cell, probably hungry, beaten, and naked. And I prayed through this and I was like, you know what? He sees them. He sees that he's not in this alone. How easily when we're going through hardships, how easily when we're dealing with things, we think we're in this by ourselves. And he, because he sees other people and he sees what they're going through and that they're like-minded like and they're fighting the same fight, he feels joy. He goes, listen, we are, we are tied together and you are a part of my heart and I see you. And yet, there's 50 of us here tonight. How many of you really see each other? Now, I'm not saying, oh, I see them. But do you see them? Do you see them the way Paul sees the other believers? Do you see people that way? Do you see other believers that way? So we're going to delve a little bit into that. Here we go. 
really it comes down to we create so much separation. I have my group of friends. How many of you, ha, did anybody meet anybody new this, this, this evening? Anybody? There's new people here. How come you didn't see them? But, but we get so stuck. There's so much separation in our group of people. Then how do we continue to build the group together? So here we go. Number one, to truly see others, you must have them in your heart. Paul says very clearly, you are in my heart. Why? Because the God of the universe is in his heart. And I don't know if you know this, but God cares about each and every person. And if you love God and have God in your heart, therefore you should have all his people in your heart. There's no option. So to truly see people, you go, I, I see people, do you really? But let's talk about what that looks like. So to truly see others, you have to have them in your heart. You have to care for them. You have to understand that the God of the universe cares about them so much. And because you are a follower of Christ Jesus, you yourself have the same heart for them. Do you? Do you have that same heart? Can you truly see somebody if you don't know them? Maybe there's a process where you start to get to know them. You know their heart. Paul obviously has a relationship with the people in Philippi. He has relationship. He sees them. You can't, like, if, if we are called as a youth group to join together, we can't join together if you don't know anybody else. We can't join together unless you truly see everybody else in this group. To have them in your heart. To be for them to hold a fraction of the feeling for them that God does. I guarantee you, if you had a fraction of the heart for the other people in this group or the other believers, man, the love that you would be sharing with them. See, to have them in your heart is to care so deeply. This is not romantically. This is not like we're besties. This is like, hey, listen, Josiah, I care. You are a part of my heart, and I care so much about you chasing after God and, and where you go and, and how you walk with the Lord and how you grow in the Lord. And, and I pray for you and I keep you in my heart and all these things. And, like, do we really do that for everybody else in here? I can't say we do that very often, do we? We don't. So, how well have you tried to see others around you? To rejoice in them. How about in school and youth group? Do you see them? Number two, you need to see them in joy and thankfulness. Don't get me wrong. We don't get along with everybody, and that's okay. But do you see them? Can you see them? Care for them with joy and all those things? Joy and righteousness? Like, can you... To see somebody enjoy, like, but I don't get along with them. But do you see them in the joy of the Lord? That's huge. Do they bring you joy and thankfulness? And I can say honestly that maybe our best friends bring us joy and thankfulness. Maybe the few people we know, but do we understand that we are all, if we're believers of Christ, we are called to come together to feel that. I think we get caught too much up in little squabbles, differences, and we lose so much. In fact, I, I was talking with a student today. Well, student, they're 24. One of my old students, they're a youth pastor over in North Dakota. And I was talking to them today, and um, they're like, oh, my, this little town I'm serving in sucks. I'm like, why? They're like, literally, it is the worst little town ever. I'm like, why? What's so bad about it? They're like, literally, there are family feuds that date back 100 years. They're like, well, my great-grandmother threw a rock at their great-grandmother, and none of our families have talked since. Like, the people still mad are not even involved in the initial war. Like, when you live in a small town, like... Do you hear, see, hear how stupid that looks? Like, well, that person was my friend, but, you know, they, they're not my friend anymore, so we don't talk. We don't talk anymore. Like, or, you know, I don't, I don't know that person, so I'm never going to talk to them. What? We have so many, we create so much separation. There's so many stupid things that divide us. And here, Paul is going, hey, we are together in this. We are together in the glory of the Lord. Do you realize we're on the same team? And do we live to that? Do we live to that? (sighs) 
every single person here can bring joy and thankfulness to the Lord, why can't they do it to us? We have to chase it. We have to try to see that in others. And maybe it takes some time to be more and more comfortable, to be appreciated. I don't know if I told you this story. I, my parents moved a lot. Uh, I'll never forget, I went to one elementary school, first grade. Went to another elementary school, second grade through fifth grade. Moved to a different district, went to middle school, sixth through ninth, eighth grade. Moved again, went to a high school for two years, and then moved to another high school for another two years. I had a lot of chances to recreate myself. To tr I, I, I found myself constantly trying to be seen. First elementary school, first grade, I was the creepy kid playing in the dirt nonstop. Didn't have any friends. No one ever talked to me. I wish I would have been seen. Second grade, go to this new elementary school. I finally made a friend. Only one. And we were like, I don't know if there was like this, these little like um, dome, the metal dome things that you climb over, right? And there's little tiny red rock or little rocks like all around it. And we would crawl on our hands and knees during recess and try to find agates in the rock. That's all we did. It was, that was the big thing. Second, third, fourth grade. End of fourth grade, my friend comes to me. My one friend comes up to me and goes, I don't want to be your friend anymore. He was my only friend. He was my neighbor. He said, I never want to talk to you again. And he walked away. I've never talked to him since. So then I go to middle school. What's well, interesting, because this switch between fifth grade and sixth grade, we actually switched churches the same year, which is a big hit, because a lot of my social friends have been in church and school. So we switched churches and school districts in this one year. Sixth grade, okay, I'm starting new. So I met all these friends at church. I'm like, oh, we get along. They're my small groups. They're friends. They're so nice to me at, at, at church. The second I go to school, though, they would not talk to me. What? What have we come to? We're on the same team. I'm like their best friend at church. But the second we go to school, they're in a different social class. So they sit at a different table. I remember one day I walked up to the lunch table. Normally I would eat over uh, this weird table, like with the kids that like only get ranch and, and like piles of carrots. You know, you know those guys? There's a few of them in middle school. You're like, he's going to start turning orange. All it is carrots and ranch, carrots and ranch. Okay? I sat at that table. And one time I'm like, okay. I'm going to go sit with my friends from church. And I grabbed my thing and I walked over and they're like, sorry, there's no space. And they would not talk to me or address me at school. They didn't truly see me. How mean people can be. We were on the same team. They would acknowledge me over here but completely ignore me over here. And then I would, and th I would try to change myself. Then I became a bully because I'm like, I want people to see me. And I found myself fighting for it. You know what? If they would have just seen me, I think I would have been more comfortable with who God created me to be. So my question is, is the second you see people, do you understand you can actually help them be just who God's called them to be? I hope we're a youth group who sees people. And as you see them, you, you find joy and thankfulness that they're a part of your life. Even the unique, quirky ones, we need them. Number three, you need to pray for them constantly. This is what we don't do. Most of the time, our prayer lives exist based on the fact that I have an issue, I need to pray. Or someone I know is hurt, I need to pray. How much do we pray for the other believers that we go to school with? How much do we pray for the other people in this youth group? See, we see Paul literally is like, hey, I pray for you. Like you are in my heart and in my prayers. He's not even with them. But he knows that they're on the same team and he prays for them and thinks for, of them. What if we as a youth group prayed for one another like that? That would be so powerful. But do we do that? No. We might pray for our close friends. We need to pray towards them constantly. And what happens when you pray, it heart turns your heart more and more towards them. 
you guys understand, prayer a lot of times actually helps our hearts. Prayer a lot of times actually helps us turn more towards them. Prayer helps us go, hey, I don't know what you're going through, but I might have a heart for you, so I'm going to keep praying for you. And then I have a more and more of a heart for you. Prayer is like the start. It's like getting the ball rolling. And yet we don't do that enough. We need to pray for them constantly. And number four, can you pray for their growth in the Lord's love? See, Paul doesn't just say, hey, I just pray for you in general. I pray that you might grow in the Lord, grow in his love, that you would, and see, Paul is not just praying generally for them. He's praying defiantly for them to grow in Christ Jesus. He's praying for them to continue to advance the gospel. He's praying for them to continue, continually glorify the Lord. Do we pray for others around us like that or do we mostly pray because I want what I want? Because I'm having a bad day. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to put some feet to the ground. Um, Nathan or Anaya, someone, I want some light worship music or something for like four or five minutes. We can find it. Here's what we're going to do. You don't need to know names to pray for somebody. It could be, it could be guy in the red shirt with the camo hat. I'm going to pray for guy with the red shirt and the camo hat. I'm going to pray for, you know, lady with the plaid jacket that's still wearing a purse or something over her back. I don't know. I'm going to pray for, I'm going to pray for the sassy girl with the green sweatshirt and the Nike thing. I don't, you know, and so here's what I want you to do. I want you to look around right now. Look around. Seriously, look around, and I want you to, in your mind, think of three people in this room that you don't know. Three people in this room, you're like, I don't actually know that person, but you're going to, what we're going to do is, you're going to, like, not, you don't have to go, like, lay a hand or anything. You can face back forward, but I want you to have those three people in your mind that you don't know well, and I want you to pray for them. We're going to spend five minutes of literal prayer for those three people that you don't know. And I want you to see what God does in your heart. I want, you to, I want you to find joy in the fact that God created them and they're here tonight. I want you to pray for their relationship with Christ and that they would continue to grow and that they would see God. This might be uncomfortable, but at least I'm not making you go do it physically, right? So, and then I'll close it in prayer in five minutes. Did everybody get three people in their head? Put your Bibles on the floor. I don't want distractions. We're going to turn it up a little bit and then I'll close it in five minutes. Let's pray. against the water Now I'm waiting if you please We've longed to see the roses But never felt the thorns And bought our pretty crown But never paid the price Find me in the river Find me there Find me on my knees With my soul laid bare Even though you're gone And I'm cracked and dry
find me in the river. Find me on my knees. I've walked against the water. Now I'm waiting if you please. We didn't count on suffering. We didn't count on pain. But if the blessings in the valley, then in the river I will wait. Find me in the river. Find me there. Find me on my knees with my soul. Find me in the river. Lord, I just thank you so much for the chance we have to gather. Lord, I pray for all these people in this room, Lord. <sighs> Thankfulness that they are a part of my life. Pray that they're all chasing you. Pray that they're all growing closer to you. Continue to reveal yourself to all of them. That they might chase after you. Lord, you find so much joy and thankfulness in them, Lord. I just pray they know it. I pray that we might find unity in how we see people, how we see other believers, Lord. Help us be a different breed of Christian that truly see people for who you created them to be. Even in the middle of our hardships, in the middle of a prison, Lord. We see people. Lord, we thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your truth, oh Lord. We love you. Amen. Okay, here's my question. Be honest with me. This is neutral. This is more negative. This is more positive. Do you feel like that positively affected your heart, stayed the same, or negatively affected your heart? Show me. Guys, that was five minutes. I, I, there's not a lot of people that are going like this. So it's like, okay, a little bit. They're giving me 10%. Guys, that was five minutes. We only prayed for each other for five minutes, and you don't even know their names. Can you imagine if you actually met them and got to know a little bit of their name and their story and see them? Let's be that youth group. Can you imagine if God moved you away and you could write to us and go, how are you guys doing? I'm going through hardships, but I think about you and I pray for you. And I have so much joy remembering the season we spent together. Wouldn't that be so awesome if we lived that life and that style? So we have a few questions for you, follow-up questions. These are what you're going to discuss in your small group questions. Leaders, you can take pictures. Number one, how well do you see fellow believers, kids at youth group, school, etc.? Do you see them... I meant, uh, did I say with joy? Do you see them with, in my notes it says with joy. <laughs> Do you see them with joy and thankfulness for joining you in the fight for the Lord? 
How much do you pray for your fellow believers, including at youth group? What was something new that you learned tonight? I want you to sort through this. Nathan's going to play music at about five, six till. Let's go six till. Um, we have camp things to hand out, calendars and all that kind of stuff and a bunch of announcements. We'll get to that. But have an amazing small group. Dissect it, talk about it, and we'll go from there. Okay, break.